Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. We've got a Global Star satellite phone for you. Uh, this came in the previous mailbag, uh, courtesy of Dan from uh, Electronic Responsible Recyclers, and I'll link them in down below. Thank you very much, Dan, and all the guys there. And um, this is a 2005 vintage satellite phone, but I just had a quick squeeze, and apparently um, at least one Australian company is still selling this thing 10 years later for like 500 hundred uh, bucks although this is the uh, GSP 1600 model but I it's been replaced by the GSP 1700 model which is the latest one and yes it's um basically it's a tri-mode uh, phone let me take a look here as you can see it's got a regular old old school um, cellular antenna for the uh, regular I believe the regular uh, cellular bands and uh, then it's got what I'll call an erectile antenna, because, well, it erects like that, and uh, and goes up, and bingo, you've got your satellite antenna, at, oh, and now it's looking, here we go, it does actually work, it's looking for uh, service now that we instantly put that antenna up. And you can see that this is uh, from Qualcomm, you've no doubt uh, heard of them, it was a partnership uh, between Qualcomm and uh, some other uh, company, this Global Star Network, it's one of uh, several satellite uh, services. And this one start. they put their first satellites up in uh, 1998 and they started, look at that, look at those graphics, that <laughs> LCD is really quite dodgy but... Uh, Safety, your most important call. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, first satellites up in uh, 1998 and uh, the first um, uh, service in around about 2000, I think. And they've got a network, or did have a network, of uh, 48 operational uh, satellites plus four spare. And they're up in that uh, low Earth orbit, uh, orbiting around about uh, 1,400 kilometres or thereabouts. And it covers most of the continents um, in the world. It doesn't co cover the uh, polar uh, regions, but uh, yeah, it, it certainly covers all of Australia and probably, I don't know, maybe looking at the coverage map, here it is, maybe about, uh, you know, 90%, 95% of um, most land mass. So that's not too bad at all. And their original uh, price for this thing was $1.79 a minute. I'm not sure how they can... Uh, make money with that there um i think they've got like 250 couple hundred thousand users or something like that and basically given the growth of modern mobile phones practically everyone on the planet has um mobile phone uh, coverage especially in um, you know most urban areas then you know, the need for one of these satellite phones is uh, very niche. It uh, really almost always has been uh, kind of niche when uh, you're out, you know, most of the time you're going to be in cellular uh, coverage network, but it's quite common for, you know, people who go uh, hiking and stuff like that to take one of these uh, satellite phones, go on and go into remote locations and uh, stuff like that. I know that um, even in Australia here, some government departments, actually, if you're going, you know, and right in the outback and stuff like that, there's no cellular coverage. I think it's mandatory that you actually, uh, you know, OHS regulations and all that crap, that you take one of these um, satellite phones, be it uh, one of these uh, Global Star Network ones or one of the um, other brand ones. And I love this erectile antenna. You'll notice that it's uh, sort of, you know, tucked in down there. When you pull it up like that, it goes erect and extends. Woohoo! And it... Uh, locks into position like that. That is actually for, if you're left-handed, if you hold it up to your left-hand ear, it's designed for the antenna to point directly upwards like that with the mobile phone in that natural uh, orientation like that. Or And it snaps, locks into that location, or you bend it over, lock it into that one. See? There you go. It really is uh, quite natural, actually. Somebody was Somebody was thinking with that. They put the antenna upright. Got to get the best, you know, signal to noise ratio you can, I guess. And uh, for left-handed or right-handed use. So it's directly up like that. Beauty. Check it out. I've come outside and we've got one. Awesome. <laughs> oh, it was. It had something there. It had something. So I wouldn't have expected uh, coverage inside the lab, satellite coverage in there, because we're, you know, inside a, a big modern office building surrounded by uh, concrete, smack in the middle, there we go. Yeah, there's, 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 I think that's two bars. I think we're sweet. There we go, I can, uh, yeah.
make my satellite call beauty. Let's try a dialer joke. So yeah, it at least uh, connected outside. I didn't expect anything indoors, of course. But um, yeah, um, Dan did mention there's something wrong with the cellular antenna. I'm not sure if he's talking about that um, or whether or not he was talking about the... Uh, uh, well, yeah, I guess he would have said uh, satellite antenna if he meant that. Anyway, it seemed to work. The reception was dodgy, though. It seemed to, like, barely hold at all. And uh, there's our battery pack. What is it? 7.2 volt lithium ion. Yep. And uh, I don't, I don't know if these things have um, SIM cards. Actually, I got no idea. But it doesn't, doesn't look like it. Um, and but anyway, assembled in the USA, USA, USA. So let's rip this sucker apart and uh, see. Oh, by the way, this is an. Look at this evil piece of shit connector. Look at this custom job. Oh. That is just, it really is evil. And, you know, you're stuck in the middle of bloody nowhere, right? And, you, you know, especially in today's age with the, you know, the micro USB uh, standard or even a mini USB, heck, to, uh, you know, charge things up with your power adapters and stuff like that. Unbelievable. Sure, okay, you got your, um, your car charger thing with it, but, geez, like, no, fail. Some poor bastard's obituary reads that I oh, died in the middle of the bloody outback because of a stupid connector. All right, so let's crack this thing open. There was a couple of torque screws on the end here, and I expect a couple of, yep, well, kind of see it already, a couple of uh, shielded cans, because this is going to be, uh, well, tri-mode, as they um, said. Like, you know, they're going to have separate uh, uh, transceivers for the uh, satellite phone. It's going to draw a fair bit of power, hence why they can only uh, turn it on when you flip the antenna up. And, uh, of course, the regular cellular one like this. And um, it's actually not surprising that this had the, um, like, effect, maybe like a t almost a 10-year life um, span on this phone because, well, you know, they haven't got that consumer demand to keep redesigning these things every bloody nine months and, and you know, or 18 months, however long. I think that's the average time people change their phones, isn't it? 18 months or, or a year or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, they just don't have that sort of uh, commercial pressure because of the uh, low volume. So they make one design and they stick to it. Uh, might have to get my spudger out, I think. There's a nice little touch. Check it out. There's a little rubber bumper in there that just sits in there like that to to stop it whacking against that end stop. Isn't that? That's very nice. Nice little attention to detail there. I love it. From no doubt the same person who designed the erectile antenna. Imagine having that on your resume. I do, I've got a patent for the erectile antenna. Yeah, I wonder, can anyone find the patent on that? Maybe it is, I don't know. Oh, I found the SIM module. It, it actually popped out. I couldn't actually get that out before, but uh, yeah, it popped out. It does have a SIM in it. Look at that. So, that's uh, no doubt the account is probably dead, but uh, somebody hasn't paid their bill. Ooh, look how big my antenna is. Um, it looks like there's a little thing under there that maybe flip this cap off that uh, maybe some big ass uh, screw under there holding it, holding bolt holding it in and uh, that's why I can't get the top part of this damn case off. And there's got to be some clever way this works. It spins around like this but I'm <laughs> buggered if I can get it off. Anyway, looks like there's two coaxes in there which is rather interesting. I'm not sure what the go is there, but oh man, you think I can get this bloody thing off? No. Nah. It's probably some easy idiot proof way to do it and I'm just, well, I'm the master idiot. And yes, of course, it was obvious that uh, this um, cover came off here, this sticker, but uh, trust me, that was like a real tough polycarbonate. There seemed to be absolutely no way to get it out. Um, but yeah, I persisted. You couldn't cut through it. Um, it was a big polycarb uh, sheet. Well and truly stoked. It doesn't look like there's any glue residue, but yeah, it did not look like that come out at first go. But anyway, ta-da! It was obvious. I thought there might have been some clever system that this sort of, you know, rotated around a certain position and then lifted out. Kind of like the, um, uh, the bales on, like, a, you know, um, gear. Like, you know, Tech and Agilent gear. You rotate them to a certain position and then they uh, 
then they just, you know, pop out magically. But ta-da! There you go. There's our, uh, you can see I've had a bit of a hack around there. But, uh, a bit of strain relief in there. So that's all right. And there's an indent there. Oh yeah, there we go. There's the indent. There's the indent. And they've got another indent around here somewhere as well. Oh no, there we go. The second one pops into there. Nice. And the antenna connectors aren't bodge uh, soldered onto the board either. No siree, Bob. They're a uh, nice little uh, coax board interconnection. You'll notice that there's three connectors down in there. So that's rather interesting. It was uh, this, the antennas were plugged into this one and this one, but this one over here, which looks different. So that's probably some sort of uh, production test connector perhaps or some other model that has a different type of antenna I don't know but yeah more likely to be uh, maybe a production test connector a little bit more detail on that in there yeah look they've got a nice little uh, nice little spring there they don't have it on the other on this uh, top side up here but down there that's really quite nice I like that they've designed that well Anyway, ta-da, there's our extra two screws. Now we're going to be in like Flynn. So here we go, we're about to lift the skirt and... Whoop. Hey, there we go, we're off. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing in... Um, uh, by the way, I've torn down an old uh, Motorola brick phone. It was from the uh, 90s, I think. I can't remember the exact date. Anyway, I'll link that in there. Very similar um, construction of this. All your separate RF cans for everything. Uh, all your chipsets weren't very integrated uh, back then and especially uh, because it's not a consumer uh, band or anything like that I don't believe so they probably had to you know roll their own custom uh, solution so you wouldn't expect like you know a single chip solution like you get these days for the RF front end so that's no surprise whatsoever so that looks like a whole RF board in its own right there's nothing else there Aha, uh -huh. once you give it a moment's thought, it's pretty obvious why they're uh, using two antennas on this thing. One's going to be transmit, one's going to be receive. It's just going to be a much more efficient system for a uh, satellite-based uh, reception, whereas the mobile uh, phone antenna here is the uh, here's the connector for the mobile phone antenna. There it is. It just makes, uh, just makes contact with the dicky thing over there, and when you extend that out, that just... Uh, yeah, makes you know, contact with that. It's a really old school uh, Nokia um, kind of way of doing things. And this one um, might be, well, it probably is a production test connector, as we uh, said, but that's obviously the mobile. That's, look, that's um, uh, near the mobile. Well, that's in the path of the mobile phone uh, output there. So, yeah, maybe for an external antenna, maybe for production test or both. And sure enough, if you check the global star specs, uh, yes, this thing operates in the um, L-band, i.e. Uh, between 1 and 2 gigahertz. Uh, transmit is between 1610 and 1620 megahertz, and receiving is between 2484 megahertz and 2499 megahertz. So that's, yes, yeah, so, you know, on the uh, lowest side of the L-band, 15 to 30 uh, centimetre range for those who are... Uh, like to for those ham buffs who uh, like to work in centimeters and the reason they're using the L band for uh, satellite uh, phones like this is the same reason GPS is in the L band as well because it had and lots of other uh, services that communicate with satellites because it's the most efficient in terms of uh, you know, it's not obstructed by uh, you know storms and clouds and and tree cover and all that sort of stuff you know it it basically gets through so that's why you know there's a specific reason also anything below low one gig and above like roughly 10 gig or thereabouts is really not suitable either so it's not just a matter of higher frequency you can actually go too high above 10 gig uh, then you get massive ionospheric delays so either above or below those frequencies so yeah L band is pretty much the sweet spot and eagle-eyed viewers would have spotted this distributed element filter. It's a very simple one. You'll notice that trace above there and that trace there aren't connected to anything. They're left floating, and that's very deliberate. They're actually using that as a little bit of filtering just there. So I've done uh, previous videos on distributed element filters. And having seen previous vintage uh, GSM phone teardowns, you will instantly notice this block here 
which, if you haven't seen one before, looks very funny, but uh, it's actually a dielectric filter. So it's a huge block of dielectric material with various, um, you'll notice different size holes in it. So it's various tuned holes in there. So it's actually working as a filter block. And uh, they're, they're really unusual beasts, but they're, uh, they're very common in uh, GSM mobile phones. And that's directly on the um, output stage. So we follow the RF output from presumably the main RF amplifier out here. Then we've got it going through this can. I have no idea what that puppy's doing, but uh, uh, T1, is it some sort of uh, a common uh, output coupled transformer? Mm, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, we've got that can there. We've got it then going now into our um, dielectric filter here. Then it pops out there. See the trace coming along here. And then it's picked off. The trace is AC coupled off here. So that's got to be some sort of RF detection or something. Oh, actually, is that, a, is that an inductor? If that's an inductor then that could be some uh, DC um, in power insertion into the output stage, perhaps, to power stuff. So it's that, it's either that or it's RF uh, detection. Anyway, goes around here, snakes around, got a little bit of uh, the distributed element filter, as we saw there. Not sure what that puppy's doing, maybe some sort of clamp. And uh, then we've got that output uh, jack, which is not being used, could be a test connector. And then we've got some just some output, uh, more some output filter components here, missing inductor there, down the ground. And Bob's your uncle, goes straight out to the antenna. Ethel RF? Is that the code name for this project? Ethel? It was named after one of the designer's grandmothers or something? Hmm. And of course you'll notice that, I'm not sure whether or not this is the transmit or uh, receive ones for the uh, satellite phone, but... Uh, Obviously a completely separate uh, block here, and, uh, oh, no, we can't lift that. Oh, what? Thankfully we can get the cans off all these other ones. Annoyingly they've got these things. I might uh, cut those off in a minute to get a look at the chip numbers, but those who know their uh, GSM mobile phone uh, block diagrams might be able to... Uh, point out what these ones are. So in here there's going to be typical blocks you'll find in some like an old school GSM uh, phone you know they do this pretty integrated these days but back then yeah separate sections or separate CAN base so you're going to have you know bandpass filtering on your output you're going to have some low noise amplification somewhere you're going to have a couple of voltage controlled oscillators Somewhere, perhaps, uh, you're going to have um, your main uh, TCXO is probably in there. And you're going to have more and more filtering somewhere. Then you're going to have a power amplifier block. So, I don't know, let me chop those out and we should be able to get a decent part number. Uh -huh, look at this, this uh, RF amp here, they're actually sharing the same can. This one's clearly driving, you see the trace going out there to the uh, uh, satellite phone um, output uh, I guess output uh, filter or maybe output uh, power amp or whatever. So there, that that's a Rockwell chipset. Can't find any data on that first glance. Interestingly, 17th week 99. This is supposed to be a 2005 vintage phone, but it's using uh, Rockwell chips dated from uh, 1999. So, geez, I don't know what's going on there. Couldn't find any data for that puppy. That's for the GSM uh, output. And, well, we've probably got, looks like we've got a, uh, some switch mode action happening around here. You can tell by the big, big ass inductor, the big ass caps in there, and the, um, large current, uh, traces and multiple pins tied together. You don't even have to look at those pin numbers. But, by the way, not everything is going to be on here because, uh, there is a ton of stuff on the bottom side. I think we've got even more shielder cans on the bottom side of this board. Actually, this is really interesting. Take a look at this custom uh, power connector we saw on the end before. It's actually got connectors on both sides of this puppy, and they've actually wedged the boards together like that. So you can see the pads under there, and you've got power going to both boards, and the little clips in there, those tiny little clips, actually clip in through those holes there. So really is quite a neat solution anyway. Look at this bottom side, 
we've just got a ton of cans, this big border board interconnect there, and uh, that is just a, oh, man, a ton of stuff. That is the bottom side, so they've shielded all that, so that's going to be all the processing and whatnot. Um, but on this side here, here's the bottom side of the RF um, section, and look at all the cans. Wow! Cows until the cans until the cows come home. Got some really good um, RF uh, shielding between the two um, modules like that. So that's that's really good. They're getting the uh, RF impedance down using those. Very nice. What's this made in Taiwan rubbish? I thought this was made by Uncle Sam in the United States of America. Wow, look at this, folks. Can't get all the cans off, unfortunately. But, uh, geez, we've got a ton of stuff under here. Wow, we could be here all day if you tried to find part numbers on these old puppies. Don't know exactly what that down in there is, but uh, I would, my guess would be some sort of a uh, saw filter perhaps. And no surprises for eventually finding a Qualcomm part in here. That's a uh, TCM 8400A. Once again, can't get any data on that, but you can see it on these those uh, you know third-party uh, chip uh, vendor sites and the obsolete uh, part vendor sites and things like that. So yeah, I don't know, some sort of baseband processor or something perhaps. We've got ourselves a 19.68 meg uh, KSS brand uh, crystal once again, uh, sort of late 1999. So this thing was definitely manufactured in 99. It's not like they were uh, using old chips back then. So yeah, this is a really old. Uh, Handset. Not sure what that puppy with TMX L003 is. Uh, made in France. Woohoo! I don't want my French viewers. I love the SOT23 <laughs> mounted on a ceramic hybrid base. <laughs> Look at that. That is unusual. There could be some, um, yeah, other hybridy stuff on the other side, perhaps. Huh, who knows? And we can just generally scan around the other modules here and, uh, Scream out if you see anything remotely familiar. Go on, yell it out, leave it in the YouTube comments, you can do it. Yeah, so I reckon that could be a local oscillator of sorts in there, perhaps. ZA9927, let's look that one up. Uh, don't know why I bother anymore, zippity doo on that part. I'm not taking more than two seconds to uh, have a look at these things, so... I don't know what's going on in there, not much, maybe some sort of mixing, perhaps, who knows, but uh, not sure what's under, so they've got a can within a can there, by the looks of it, and there's that main, I presume, TCXO, but yeah, there's quite a lot of blocks under here, unbelievable, I could be here all day trying to sort this out, and unfortunately, can't get those cans off, I'd have to brutalise them. I'll give you one guess what main processor is inside this thing. Go on, guess. You ready? Ta-da! Intel i386EX. Who guessed it? Come on, be honest, I didn't. And we've got more Qualcomm goodness, the gum 2000. Um, CD90, once again, can't get any data on that one at first glance. Got some maximum uh, and TI action happening down here. Under here, that Intel 386 wasn't enough, so they had to put an analog devices DSP in there as well. Wow! And under this metal can over here, we've got some uh, flash and memory as well. And that's all she wrote on those boards, but check out all those test points. And curiosity got the better of me inside this uh, can. Instead of desoldering, it's just easier just to open the thing up with a pair of uh, side cutters and pliers. And it uh, looks like we have maybe an attenuator and filter, perhaps. That's, yeah, that's about all she wrote. So there you have it. That is inside a 15-year-old satellite phone. And as you can see, yeah, technology has progressed a lot in terms of, well, you know, we don't have satellite phones in your pockets, although you can now get uh, Iridium 
uh, and other networks, maybe even Global Star, I don't know, but uh, attachments for your mobile phone. So they slip over your smartphone and they can, yeah, um, <laughs> go. You can go satellite. So you don't actually need a satellite phone anymore. You just get the add the clip module that you go on the back of the thing and and it just does the business. So, yeah, but hey, these were um, extremely popular. This might even be one of the most popular uh, satellite phones of all time, perhaps. So, yeah, I think they probably sold a couple of hundred thousand of these puppies. And well, yeah, the march of progress, you just don't get those huge individual canned constructions like this anymore. Well, you kind of do, but yeah, look at just, just how many of them there are. You'd get much more integration these days. I mean, this is an absolutely ginormous phone, pretty standard surface mount technology. We've got all like quad flat packs in here, nothing special. There's basically no uh, BGA devices. I don't think there's none of that fancy rubbish. No siree bob there. There's all just, you know, pretty much, um, just standard off-the-shelf through-hole stuff that they could have, you know, you could manufacture this in any uh, local assembly house down the road. You don't see need some whiz-bang, uh, you know, Fox state-of-the-art Foxconn factory to manufacture your uh, ridiculously state-of-the-art uh, iPhones and other uh, smartphones these days, which are built down to the absolute tiniest dimensions possible with the highest amount of integration. But Hey, it wasn't a factor 15 years ago. This would have been designed, maybe started the design of this, say, 17 years ago, um, back in, you know, 96, 97, when they were uh, putting up the first network, they would have started designing their first phone. So, yeah, that's what they had to work with. And uh, cost wasn't a huge factor, I don't think, because this is not your regular uh, consumer grade uh, phone. But we saw, hey, very similar construction in the uh, Motorola uh, brick phones, which have uh, torn down before. And if you want to see it, um, wait until the end of the video and I'll put up uh, rolling links to those videos. And there you go. That's inside your antenna. We've got helical wrapping there around your, uh, like some sort of, you know, um, mylar or something former. I don't know what that is. But anyway, so that's, look, and there's, that's interesting how they bridged them at that point there and then got them going off in that direction and that direction. So they've got it coming from here, that overlap into there. So anyone into their antenna design theory, oh, please uh, key us in on that one. So anyway, you're going to have a uh, transmit and a receive antenna in there. And uh, not sure what's going on there. We've got a package under there. Well, we've got some sort of some sort of package by the looks of it that could be some thermal well probably not a thermal pad because they haven't uh put that on the bottom but i think there's something something going on there bingo we've got ourselves another dielectric filter there check that out and an so package that's a bit unusual ray good day ray how you doing mate yeah so i think what's going on here is that this one down here if they shorter stubs like that is our receiving antenna because that's I believe going to be a higher frequency and this one up here is our transmitter so you can just tell it's longer a uh, longer wavelength because our um, as I said the transmitter frequency is uh, lower than the received frequency so I think that's what's going on there but they've wound them on the same former and if you look carefully in there it looks like they've got a pattern on the inside as well like an inside for that one actually extends out longer than this side so that's quite unusual anyway hope you enjoyed that if you want to discuss it jump on over to the ev blog forum the link is down below hope you liked it catch you next time